Well, thanks so much for your time. I really enjoyed your memoir, The Chiffon Trenches. I found it super interesting and fascinating, as I'm sure everybody else did. <laughs> um, can you tell me what exactly inspired you to write your memoir? I know you've had a lifetime of experience and you had so many great stories and everything, but why, why go through all the, the heartache and the time and everything of writing a memoir? What, and why now? I decided to write the book because I wanted to write an epistle of love and uh, a, a, a chronicling of my uh, life. I'm 71 years old, proud to be 71. And I thought it was important for me as my story was unique. My narrative had taken a trajectories, many uh, different tributaries of uniqueness in my life that I had to write this book. I was compelled to write the book because I had this documentary called The Gospel According to Andre which came out in uh, 2018, and it was so warmly received by the people who saw this documentary and so many different walks of life, people in the street, my colleagues, uh, just, I just, it compelled me to write the book. And I didn't have a set um, plan to write a certain kind of book. I just sat down and started writing once I got the uh, book deal with Ballantyne Penguin Random House. I had no notes. I had no diaries. It all came from my head. Wow. Mm. When you start, <clears throat> excuse me, when you started writing, did all of the experiences from when you were younger, some of the more painful ones, did they just start coming out or did you have any sense that you were going to want to include them? Um, they, the painful experiences have been with me all my life and all the experiences have been with me. Uh, they just came out because those things I've kept it bottled up in my brain in my mind for decades and decades. And so this book was in a way a cleansing, although it was, it was a, so much a cleansing. I realize now that I've completed the book that it was a cleansing of the spirit and the soul. And I feel very proud of it. It cleansed my soul. I had never spoken of my serial sexual abuse to anyone, no one in my family, no therapist, nothing. When I was growing up in the South, uh, African-American, uh, people of just modest means did not have therapists to go to. You couldn't go to your church because that was shaming. And I just thought that um, I could not say that to anyone. I was the only child. I lived with my grandmother. And I thought that whatever this was that had happened to me, if it, I told my grandmother, it would probably hurt her and she'd be very devastated or I would be sent away to a reform school. So I never talk about, talked about those things. So as I sat down to write, it was a very much... Um, I have, as I said, I don't write with notes. I don't have diaries. I don't go refer to books or things or articles. It just comes out. It's, I write as I feel. It's on a given day, I write, I get up and I write, and I write what is going through my head at that time. And I know you just said it was a cleansing. Did you feel like you had sort of made sense of it? after writing it or like what, and when you were actually sitting there, like with your, did you write it with a computer or by hand? Yes, computer by hand. Yeah. By hand, most of the days, sometimes I'd be traveling and I would write by hand. I remember I was in a little hotel uh, for a week in what, New York City <clears throat> in 2018, in October. And I didn't, I don't travel with my computers or laptops or things like that. So I was writing on the blotter on the desk, you know, the, the blotters, and it's a pad and it's got many, many pages. So I would wake up in the morning and write on the blotter. I wrote one chapter on by hand. And then I would scribble notes that I had on little pieces of paper as I went about in a car, if I had a thought or something like that. And um, so I forgot your question. What was oh. <laughs> I, was, I was starting to ask a question, but I was clarifying how you wrote. What I wanted to know is as you were scribbling down notes or as you were typing, when you were reliving some of that painful stuff, and I'm sorry to jump in with like all of your no, innermost no. personal trauma here, but I just like was blown away by the way you wrote about it. And no, 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 no. I just, it. It, it came out. It just came out. It just flowed out of me. It flowed, it flowed, it flowed. I did write a book before that in 2003. I wrote this book, a, a ALT, a memoir. And that also happened. It just flowed. It was just, it, I woke up one morning. I was in my grandmother's house in North Carolina. She had passed away in 1989. And I woke up and I went downstairs. I remember it's 7.30 in the morning. My computer was in the kitchen. And I sat down on the computer and at 8 o'clock. And by 3 o'clock, I had the first 25 pages of that book, the first book. 
And I read the thing and I just started writing and I read this piece and I thought, this is, is, this is something important to me. And I think this is something I need to show to somebody. And I took those 25 pages that I printed out on my computer to John Fairchild, the late John Fairchild, my former boss, who was a great man, a genius. He was very fearful, very intimidating. And we, I wasn't even at Women's Wear Daily. I was out of Women's Wear Daily for almost 30 years. And I asked Mr. Fairchild, could I see him for lunch? He took me to the fanciest place in New York, La Bernadette. And, he, and I said, Mr. Fairchild, I have something to give you. And I would like for you to read this because I trusted him. Because we had that kind of respect for each other. He, he called me up. He read it. He, he said, this is brilliant. I want to print this. It was printed in W as a, a, the first chapter. It was, a compa it was, I compared Mrs. Vreeland to my grandmother. It's all about my grandmother, Mrs. Vreeland. And that was the beginning of my first book. And I just sat down one morning and started writing. You know, so I, I could basically write, I have another book. Let me just tell you, your moms who don't have time to read books. <laughs> I have a book three in me. As I read this book, as I go over this book, as people respond to it, as so many things come up that I have not put in this book, that I could have put in the book, but I did not put in the book. Well, I will save more time for that third book of yours. I will, yeah, I will absolutely. carve it out now. When should I? Right. I'll put it in for what, like 2022 or something? Uh, 2023, I'll probably. Uh, I, I've got to get the book contract first. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, I, 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 I know that there are so many wonderful things that have happened that are not in this book that people respond to. And I didn't leave them out on purpose, but as I was writing it, those things have come to me. And now things have come to me that I forgot. And I could have put them in there. And I thought, oh, I thought, well, this could have gone in the book. And I left that out. And why did I do this? And why did I do that? Nevertheless, the book is there. And I'm proud of it. What, what are you most excited? What did you leave out that the comments have elicited and you like have to write another book to put in? Um, well, just recently, uh, Rosemary Fadenberg at WWD has a piece out right today on Fire Island. <laughs> In the 70s. And she called me and she interviewed me and Stephen Burroughs and Beth Ann Hardison. Stephen Burroughs was then one of the kings of Fire Island. He was one of the social lions of Fire Island. He and Calvin Klein were the fashion kings of Fire Island in the 70s. And she found these photographs I had done in Fire Island. And she sent them to me. She says, can you talk about these pictures? And I said, well, who did these pictures? She said, you took them. I said, what? And she said, you took them. And there was an article in Women's Wear Daily. And she started quoting the article and the people, and I thought, oh my God. And then she wrote this beautiful piece yesterday on Fire Island, and I realized that could have been a whole chapter, and it would be so relevant today. <laughs> Life in Fire Island, the liberating Fire Island, the liberating tea dance, the motel, the blue well, the blue drinks, the liberation, the naked bodies, the sex in, outdoors, the alfresco sex, of which I was an observer. I was not a participant, I was an observer. I went to Fire Island, and I, Manolo Blahnik and I became very good friends in Fire Island, and I could have written about that. So many things I could have written about Manolo Blahnik. There, there are pieces that I left out about um, Paloma Picasso's wedding. I could have described that, how brilliant that was. There was a bit of Paloma in the book. But so many trips with Paloma to Venice. In, when I went to Venice with her one summer, how I had clothes made to go on trips to Venice, and I would have wardrobes made just to go to certain destinations. Uh, all of that's very much a part. And I love the details. I like to describe details. I don't know where I got that training from, but I'm a man of nuance and detail. And I'm very proud that people say to me, I love the way the book is written. And it's so wonderful to read. And it's just, I think it's because I read so much when I was a child. I was, I was an only child and I had to make my own world. And I was reading Vogue magazine at the age of 10. I discovered it in the, the public library in Durham. And I was reading, and I remember I went to New York once on a bus with my grandmother. And um, we were coming to New York to visit her sister. She had three sisters that lived in New York. So it was a big, luxurious trip for us to go on the bus. We were going on the train before that, but it became very fast when we'll take the Trailways bus because the train was old and slow. And I was sitting next to her reading uh, Gustave Flaubert's Madame Bovary at the age of 10, in English, of course, in English. And um, I did not speak English, French at the age of 10, no. And uh, I love to read. I just would read. I'd love to read everything. Uh, one of the great things I left out of the book was how I read to Diana Vreeland. When Mrs. Vreeland went to bed and decided not to receive anyone, and this is true, she only received her grandsons, uh, Nicholas uh, Monk and Alexander Vreeland, and her sons and her immediate family. And I was the only person that she would see. 
and I would go in and read to her out loud. I, she loved my voice. I used to read entire books to her. I left that part out. That's so beautiful. That is so beautiful. I mean, you obviously have a zillion stories. You could fill probably 50 books with your stories. No, not 50. I'd say three. <laughs> okay, fine. Okay, fine. Three. <laughs> Um, but I have to say, as much as the anecdotes of who you were with are interesting because you've had this unique life and yes, just exposure yes, to people, yes. the parts that interested me the most were more about you and your yes. interior life and your yes. emotions, as particularly as it related, as we were just discussing the sexual abuse, but also how you used eating to sort of deal with your emotions mm -hmm. and how you didn't talk about that very much either. And how No, no, that could have been dealt with. I could have dealt with racism, in, a, in as I see in hindsight, I could have dealt with racism in a more uh, detailed plane. Uh, binge eating, I didn't realize I was a binge eater until after my grandmother died in 1989. And that's the year I started gaining weight. I started putting on weight because I was binge eating. And I, I just could have talked about my trips to the Duke Diet and Fitness Center. Uh, I did not choose to do that, but I realized education about binge eating helps you to control your, your weight. And um, I was eating, you know, I was eating a, fig, a, a sleeve of fig news almost every night at 11.30. When I got to Duke Diet and Fitness Center, I realized there was a thousand calories in one sleeve of fig news. I did not write that. So many things I could have written about. I could have written about my trip to, to Oprah Winfrey's television show in my early years. I could have written about how I went to the Oprah's um, legendary ball and how what a beautiful Sunday morning that was. And she had an open air spiritual church. Uh, that was so beautiful, her, her legendary, her legends ball. And I wish she would give another one. It was such a great, 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 great moment of spirituality. And she had a book beautifully printed after that and sent it to all the guests at the legendary ball. I went to the legendary ball with Mariah Carey. Uh, Mariah Carey has left out of the book. That was a great friend at one point. I don't see her much anymore because she's got her two twins. I also think that you probably responded to my early upbringing in the church, how important the church was, how important that the church impacted my appreciation of Yves Saint Laurent when I saw his first show, which was inspired by Porgy and Bess. And Porgy and Bess is this folk opera taking place in the South. And Yves Saint Laurent had never been to the South. He just listened to the music. And he created the most extraordinary a beautiful, elegant show in 1978. And that was my first important couture show in Paris. And I wrote about it and it became the rocket that took my career to the top. And um, there's a snippet of that in the book. In the, in the beginning, you see a letter from Deanna Vreeland that she wrote about that, how I described the clothes. I don't know, I don't know. I have certain gifts and I, I, I would write another book and I'd be happy to write another book because I write very fast. And I owe a great deal to my editor, Thomas Flannery Jr. And also to my, the editor, the, my key editor at Penguin House, random Penguin House, Pamela Cannon. And it's a team to print a book like this. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a team. It takes a village. <laughs> I feel like I've done a bad job because all we've done is talk about what's not in the book. And what you've done a great job. You've done a great job. But there's so much that actually was in the book that was so amazing. So I hope people don't think that like you left everything out and this is just like a, a thinly veiled, you know, preview of what's to come. <laughs> Oh, your apartment um, is so neat. Look at that etage. Oh my back gosh, there. I did oh. this yesterday. I yesterday oh, I got so neat. Room, and I made uh -huh. you, I even have your book up there, but I was gonna try to move my Oh no, no, it's beautiful. I see the etage. It's very neat, very beautiful. Yeah. I'm so impressed. Yeah, that was my work in last night with uh, so my house guests and my husband. I'm so impressed. Not usually like this uh, uh, at all. Uh, but it looks great. It looks great. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> um so do you enjoy the actual writing? I know you said you're fast and you have so many things in your head. You just like it's a funnel you can like barely get them out do you enjoy it what does it do for you to write you know i'm a very lazy person i'm essentially lazy i could stay in bed all day and look at uh tcm black and white movies and just run downstairs and get a ch chicken salad sandwich or something um i i have to process in my mind that i'm going to get up and work in that day and i'm going to get up and write and then i jump up and i start writing on the computer I, my computer is on a desk next to my bed in my bedroom I have one downstairs too, but I normally write, I wrote this whole book in this computer up here. And it, it's a joy to write because I write fast and I type fast. One of the skills I have is 
that I was in high school and I took typing. And they said, why do you want to take typing? I said, you never know. It will come in handy. It's like when you play the piano, you don't know why you're playing the piano. And I type very fast and it just comes out. It flows. It just flows. And it's just, it, 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 I, I have kept so many painful memories with some of it in the book. The, the ages and the shaming. I feel that um, you haven't addressed the whole issue of Anna Winter, but if you want to. I feel that I call it an epistle of love because in the book I express my deep hurt in her not explaining to me why suddenly I wasn't doing the Vogue podcast and why I was not doing the red carpet interviews at the Met Ball. There was no explanation of that. And that was the final straw. That was the final straw that broke the camel's back. And I decided when last year they had camp, notes on camp. I never went to notes on camp. That was the year I said, I'll never go to another Met Ball again as long as I live. And I was writing the book. The book helped me to come to that realization. So I felt that I was owed some explanation. She could go another direction. She thought that the influencer, this young African-American girl of 22 years of age or something, who has 2 million followers, was the way to go. That's fine. But just tell me and tell me, you know, you've done a great job. I appreciate it. We're moving on. No one ever explained that to me. It and it's a, never been explained to me. It was, uh, you wrote really openly about your hurt. I mean, yes. to have a relationship. Yes. It's, a, it's a betrayal in, in effect. It's a it's sense of betrayal. It's a sense, and she's since apologized in a public statement to all the people at Condé Nast now because she has shown intolerant behavior to people of color. And there's and her her lack of diversity in the magazine over the years, and I just say to her, business as usual. That was probably a statement that was co-authored by one of her editors. Business as usual, and I I know her very well, and I see her talking about it, and then the the person's drafting it out, and they write it, and it's approved. Then she clicks on her manolos and goes down the carpeted hall onto the next. Because she is a person of great power, of great influence. She has achieved a greatness in her life. And you can't take it away from her. And she will not let anything get in the way of her white privilege. That statement was a statement of survival. In this particular time, when people are addressing systemic racism in the world. You see more of Dr. Cornell West on TV than you've ever seen before. He's on Anderson Cooper. He's on Joe Scarborough, MSNBC. You see more of Cornell West speaking about racism. You see Dr. Eddie Glau Jr. at Princeton with his new book, Begin Again, about James Baldwin. And so, you know, this is, she, this was a statement she made, but whatever happens at Condé Nast, I wish her well. She wishes me well. Nothing's going to get away from her white privilege. Nothing. I think it's the personal relationship. I mean, people can put statements and address bigger societal issues, yes. but when someone's hurt you, nothing's going to make it better that's addressed to a large group. No. So if she, and, and I think that she owes me a personal apology. Mm -hmm. she, you know, a personal apology, and all would be forgiven. I, I've grown up in a Christian church, in a Christian faith, and we are forgiving people. You're a Christian, you forgive. You can forgive the worst things that have been done to you. I have forgiven all the people that serially abused me and violated me and, and, and robbed me of, uh, of the ability to be intimate because this happened to me when I was very young. And it was serial. It went on for years and years. I never told anyone. So I'm a survivor. I'm not a victim. I am, am a survivor. That's amazing. Well, it's amazing that you are you were willing to come forward and talk about it because it's so helpful to other people. And, you know, one of the things I was just so struck by in your book, it's like it, you're surrounded by people. You're literally like in, it's like, a, it's like you're in a snow globe of people <laughs> constantly like surrounding you. Yeah. And yet there's this feeling almost of loneliness. Right? Absolutely. Oh, you hit on it. You are remarkable. That is a beautiful description. I'm in a snow globe surrounded by the most glamorous, the most powerful, the most influential, Paloma Picasso, Betty Cartru, Yves Saint Laurent, Dion Van Versen, Regmano Leblanc, Anna Winter, uh, John Galliano. I'm in a vortex of glamour. And yet, there I am alone. I didn't have the confidence to tell anyone in this snow globe what had happened to me. No one, I never articulated to anyone. 
And some of my best friends, when they read the book, they say, my God, I didn't know all this stuff. I never knew all this. And, you know, and they're, they're very surprised that they didn't know it, but I just kept it to myself. So that's why I said the book was very cleansing. Mm-hmm. It was almost like a baptism in a way for me. And I, I came up out of the water, renewed. You know, when you're baptized in a missionary Baptist church, you, you're dumped by the minister, you come up, you're a new spirit. So this is what this book did for me. And I hope to, I hope to become a better person. I think there's still room for improvement. I'm very flawed. And I'm not the easiest person to get on with in that snow globe, you know. Don't think that my personality wasn't a, a, a one of intimidation in the snow globe because I was a warrior dealing with other people whose egos were, oh, my goodness, Carl Lagerfeld, oh. He was one of my closest friends. He also betrayed me. He, he dumped me. He dumped me. He dumped me as he had dumped so many people in his life. Do you feel at this stage in your life and perhaps having written the book that you have a few people close to you that you can really count on and trust? I, oh my God, yes, thank God. I count on my dear friend, Alexis Thomas. She is the chair of trustee at my church, the Abyssinian Baptist Church. I count on her. Beth Ann Hardison, a long, lifelong friend who was in the fashion world when I came into the fashion world. She was always a top, she was already a top model. Uh, my friend Janice Mays, I went to Brown with. And my friend Sandra Bernard calls me every day, the comedian. We okay. speak sometimes two and three times a day. I have five great friends that I can depend on. I also feel that I can count on Dionne von Furstenberg, who's been a dear friend of mine through thick and thin. She's been there through thick and thin. She's always a, a, a calming. But I do feel, feel that Alexis, Beth Ann, Sandra Bernard, and Janice Mays, these are the top four. Well, I'm glad. All I'm women. Glad. All women, by the way. All women. I was getting a little bit worried about you. I have to be honest. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. I, 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 Alexis has been with me through thick and thin. Alexis has gone with me to the hospital and prayed with the anesthesiologist before she went to work at seven in the morning. This Russian anesthesiologist, she took his hand in my hand and prayed before I went into the operating room for my lap band surgery, which did not work at New York Langone Medical Center. Alexis has been with me. Uh, we've, we've traveled, we've traveled, we've had great trips. We've gone on road trips together, just she and I, we've had great fun. And she's a mother of two. And she's a wonderful woman. She's a very smart woman. Beth Ann has always been there and Janice as well. Good. Well, I know I'm not a bold face name, like all your friends and you don't no, but I, know I know me, that you're but I know that you're if, you ever, if you ever need another like sympathetic ear or you're feeling like you're be, having a terrible day, I'm always around if you want to give me all a right, call or you, just chat. You, <laughs> And you're wonderful to chat with. You're wonderful to talk to. Thank you. That's very nice of you. Um, so do you have any advice? I know our time's almost up, even though I would love to keep talking to you. Do you have any advice um, to aspiring authors? My advice to aspiring authors are, is it's not necessary to keep a journal. Everyone says you must journal. It's not necessary. But in my case you must depend on the ancestral recall of experience. You must treasure the experience in your mind and in your mind's eye. You must always be able to go back in order to go forward. I got to this book because I relish and I treasure going back and going back. And one of the greatest advices I can give to anyone, a writer or anybody, is just sit down and listen to the birds and sit down on a porch or sit down in a yard or sit down on a park bench and just sit there calmly and look up at the sky and the trees and listen to the sounds of nature, the chirping of the birds going through the skies. Just find some way to be calm and just cut off all the noise and the TV, cut off all the the psychedelic noises of computers and tapping into, you know, looking at your Instagram and all of that stuff. Just be calm. Find strength in nature. And that's really the greatest advice I can give. And just have ancestral recall. And you know, ancestral recall could come not only from you, but from reading uh, authors, from reading, uh, you, reading James Baldwin or Virginia Woolf. You know, I've been reading James Baldwin for the last two weeks. And I think it's important. Um, I've been reading Virginia Woolf, Orlando, Mrs. Dalloway. Just go to the great writers, Henry James, uh, Tennessee Williams, a great, great Southern writer. I just love the Tennessee Williams, the, the thought, the lines and plays that he can give are just extraordinary. You must be inspired by something other than yourself as well. 
you know? Inspiration is a very important factor for young writers, wherever it comes from. It could be music, it could be jazz, if you like jazz. It could be classical music. It could be hip hop, or whatever you want it to be. Just be calm and depend on ancestral experience, ancestral recall. Amazing. Very important. And I, I think- talk, you, you, have to, you have to go? No, no, it's just my, <laughs> I don't have to go. My, no, I mean, I'm happy to keep chatting. My podcast is half an hour, but we can, we can keep chatting. I don't Yeah, know. if you want to keep talking, I don't know. ask me more questions. Oh my God, you're so sweet. Um, you know, one of the things that I think the book did well, and I think probably participated in your cleansing is that you finally could release all these secrets. And I feel like I've been talking to a number of authors and the, the number one thing that creates problems emotionally in any way is when you mm. hold on to a secret too tightly and it makes yes. you yes. It, it's just like the corrosive power of, of secrets and yes. i feel like you finally decided you didn't want to deal with that anymore in this book yeah I, I did that i did i did i came i was honest i had bottled up so much and i had bottled up so many things i i chose uh, they may seem small in the book but they were very important to me uh, the moments when i did have some sort of intimacy with two men one with an artist from Italy, and I sent him the, the text, and I said, listen, I want to write this in the book. Do you think you'll feel comfortable with this being printed in the book? He said, yes, I'd be honored. And then there was this, this incident with Paul Mathias in, uh, in the 70s in Paris. So it's, it's, it is, it's amazing that writing can be a cathartic. It was just, and I would write it, and then I would go back, and I would say to, I said to my editor one day, I said, Pam, do you think this is enough about this serial sexual abuse? I don't think I've written enough. And she says, no, you've written enough. It's perfect. You do not want to write any more about it. And I just said, okay, fine. And I didn't want to have a dumpster of just serial. I didn't want to go into the, the nasty, sordid, ugly, black details of the abuse. It's enough to know that it happened, you know? And um, it, it, it strengthens me to have talked about that. I feel cleansed. I feel relieved. I do feel relieved. You no, know, even if it's not right for the book, you yeah. can still write it. It sounds like maybe you want to write it and you don't want to sell it, which is fine. You know what I mean? Like all yeah, those exactly, personal details. Exactly, exactly. exactly maybe you exactly. just, uh, you know, keep it in a drawer yes, or something. Yes, I don't know. Yes, until I die, they'll find it. Yes, yes, yes. Well, okay, fine. You don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> um, since the book has come out, have any reactions disappointed you, excited you, surprised you? I mean, it's a lot to lay on the world. Oh, since the book has come out, I've been very pleasantly surprised with wonderful reviews uh, from the New York Times and the New York Times Book Review, the New York Times Podcast, the Washington Post. I was only surprised by one person who interviewed me from Parry Match. And uh, he was French and I speak French. He came up here to my house. I allowed him to come up to my house, which is not possible in a pandemic. I do everything on Zoom. But I so liked Parry Match and the idea of Parry Match. So I let him in. And he came with four pages of handwritten notes, typewritten, typewritten. And I thought he was going to do a great piece. But the piece turned out to be very disappointing because he obviously had the notion of what he was going to write in, with those notes. And you just feel like he had some agenda. He didn't write, excuse me, he didn't say anything that was personally wrong about the book. But it was just his narrative was not this narrative I thought that he was going to write about. And it was sort of, he only focused on the Anna Winter part and nothing else. And that he forgot about the other parts of the book, which are very beautiful. Tom Ford says to me, he's a dear friend, Tom Ford says, I love the first part of your book the most because it's about your emotions, it's about your, bring your childhood. That's what strikes me the most. And I remember him saying that, and I think that was wonderful. I did have a very contentious BBC hard talk with a BBC host. And, um, but he did win. I don't think I won because I didn't let him take over. He was very tough. He was very smart. He was very arrogant. And um, I didn't realize that I had not done my homework, although my publicist in England had said, BBC hard talk is they ask very tough questions. And then I got off the thing and I thought, oh, it was so early in the morning. I said, okay, this was interesting. This was hardball. I, I, I got through it. I got through it all. And since then, it's been on BBC Hard Talk. People have watched it and they call up and they say, you did an excellent job. People say, the man is awful. He, he always tries to bring up something. He tried to, you know, trip up Naomi Campbell. Well, he didn't trip me up. 
he would ask me questions like, why did you stay so long if there was no diversity at Vogue? Why would you stay there if there was such, such great lack of diversity? And I said, you know why? For the paycheck, the good paycheck. That shut him up. He didn't expect <laughs> that answer. You know, for the good paycheck. They paid me well. That's where he shut up. So it, it was very good for me. But I, I, I learned, a, a lesson was learned with talking to him. I love the, it was the conversation I had with Al Roca last Friday. It was aired on the third hour. And people are just, they love that. People are just email me and they say, oh, that was wonderful. And of course, you know, I, I, I love talking to people about the book. And uh, it's like almost my, my new social life to have to do these podcasts and Zooms. And it's great. It's just great. Um, I have had no disappointment in the book. Except, well, I was on the bestseller list the first week of the New York Times. And then the second week, it went down to 14. I don't even look at it anymore because, you know, you can't judge the New York Times bestseller. And now this book is going to come out about the Trumps next week on Tuesday. And it's just going to just hit the bestseller list. John Bolton's book, Eddie Glau Jr.'s book on James Bond was going to hit the bestseller list for sure. And um, that's just it. But I know the book is a success because people love the book. It's the most important thing that people read the book and they say they love it. I agree. It is a great book. It's, Thank you. Of course. <laughs> my, here's my last question, though. Let's say there's a boy who is going through what you're going through and feels that he can't tell anybody and he's living with his grandmother and he's in the same situation. What would you, if he, per, I mean, he won't be listening to this podcast, but let's just pretend <laughs> if you could go and talk to this child, knowing as, you know, almost 71, here you are having not talked about it and the way your life has progressed, although obviously you've achieved like the heights of success and everything else professionally. What would you say? What would you say to that boy? Would this be a boy living in today's world of 2020? Yes. I don't know. We could, you could do it either way. You could go back to, te- what would you tell yourself looking back? Maybe we should do that. What would you tell yourself looking back if you, if you could have told him any advice? It, well, I, I know, look, my knowing me and knowing how I grew up and knowing where I came from, the kind of household and the kind of culture and society, I would have never said it to anyone. I would have been, I was still afraid. I was, there was fear. There was just fear and loathing. So I would say to a boy today who was going through the, although he's not listening to this podcast, <laughs> But that the imaginary young boy, I would say, you could maybe if you can articulate it, just pull someone's coattail. Just pull someone's coattail. And just, if you can't find the words to, I could have never found the words to articulate what happened to me when I was young. Just pull and look in your eyes. Someone who loves you will know that something's wrong. And if someone just says, someone will say, what's wrong? What's wrong? And you just say, what's wrong, and it will eventually, they will lead them down the path to find out, to discover this, this, this hurt. And that's what I would advise, a young boy who would be afraid to tell anyone. But when I was growing up, you just, I couldn't. There was no way I was gonna tell my grandmother. There was no way I was gonna tell an uncle. There was no way I was gonna tell anyone. The church goers, I was, it's just the culture, I just could not have said it to anyone. I think we would have killed my grandmother. She would have had a heart attack and died if she'd known this had happened under her watch, you know? And I just couldn't, I couldn't. And I was afraid because I thought, once I realized how horrible this was, I thought, well, they'll send me away to juvenile school and I'll never be with the person I want to become. Wow. Well, I hope that wasn't too deep a, a chat yeah. just for early morning on a Friday. No, but <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, I really appreciate all your time and talking thank about you so all your much. experiences. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's been a great joy. My greatest privilege is to talk to you on Friday morning before the 4th of July. Oh, thank you. It's a good start. And I will will contact you and chat chat with you. I would love it. I'm here. All right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a great day. You too.